<clears throat> well, you can see that screen, I think, everybody. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So, um, if I do the um, introductions, in theory, we well, we won't be beyond an hour. So, uh, we ran a, a similar seminar last year, Peter and I. Peter's a, a, an expert on mergers and acquisitions, putting deals together, and so on, finding out who's who's uh, in, mainly in the IFA sector, but also in the mortgage and protection sector, retail financial services, as I call it. Yeah. And uh, the so there's a lot of activity going on there to be fair there always has been um and um the uh so peter will run the first half and talk about his view of things his independent uh, broker and then i'll talk about uh, some of the more technical issues um in the second half so without further ado shall i uh, hand over to peter okay well thanks thanks everyone coming today i think we've got a reasonable turnout um just put if you put the next slide up uh charlie number two uh okay just to give you a very brief background i've been 30 odd years 33 years in financial services uh i've been directly authorized i run a top 100 ifa firm uh currently what i've been doing now i've been doing this for 10 years it's actually more than 10 years now it's probably getting on 12 years uh, in the open market and consultant work. Um, and I've done well over 100 deals. Uh, as every year goes by, more, more done. Um, I don't just do broker work. I actually get involved with the consultant side, uh, whether that would be for a fund manager or a services firm. Uh, I did some work uh, a couple of years ago with a quite a large firm uh, looking at their recruitment uh offering so uh, i'll get involved with various different items um i'll go on to i'm conscious of the time to keep it in the hour so we'll go to page uh, slide three okay so current market um it is lots of figures they they say uh, whether it's a, an actual exact figure uh they say there's around 4,000. And when I say they say the marketplace, says there's about 4,000 potential retiring advisors over the next three to five years. Um, that equates to something like 100 million of funds under management. The average age of the advisor marketplace is 59. Uh, we're all not getting any younger. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, I think, for the marketplace is that there's not enough new blood coming in. Uh, hence, our average age is uh, it's older than a lot of other industries. Um, so that I think it's the figures are something like for every uh, 10 advisors who retire, we, we only take in about one new people to replace. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of market um, in, in bringing in new new people to the uh, where are the buyers coming from? Well, when I first started doing this, the the buyers were very much existing IFA uh, tied firms that were buying uh, client bases from advisors that were uh, leaving the industry to uh, well, retire. Um, or one or two cases, some people would like were off and do something else. Um, they were very traditional buyers, so it's all standard regional firms, nationals, they were the ones buying it. It was a very straightforward marketplace. What's happened in the last two years uh, is the market really on the top end, or the middle of the top end, has been turned on by private equity firms uh, or private equity backed firms. Uh, some of these firms are have, have almost no experience but they see buying a financial services firm uh, is a way of getting uh, building a company very quickly uh, with the idea of selling on in two or three years time uh, where you've got the likes of uh, Scott Lloyd as an example um, they were bought 
money went in by Oak Tree Capital, uh, set up Bell Penny. Bell Penny then bought Ascot Lloyd and merged it. Ascot Lloyd then uh, was sold recently to Nordic Bank. Uh, and I can see a lot more of those deals happening. Um, these types of companies tend to look at uh, the bigger companies. Uh, um, so um, when I say bigger companies, we're looking at, most of them won't look at a firm less than 100 million fund per month. So that's really where that market is being uh, very hot. It's gone completely reversed. When I started doing this, the smaller end was very, very busy. Uh, now the top end is very busy. Uh, and, and my personal uh, view on it is that at the moment there's a lot of buyers chasing the same firm. Um, and that is not something that will go on longer. But we'll go up, uh, next slide, please. Okay. So um, there's a move to, I say the move to restricted advice, that started to go that way. Um, I think a lot of the bigger players like your Quilters, Openworks, uh, will move that way. That Networks are finding it very difficult advisors. Uh, so again, that's a contributing factor. Um, there's a concern from distribution going forward. So what what happened, as I said already, about the, the actual advisors? Um, I think a lot of, of, of companies are looking at their client bases and uh, maybe offloading some of their smaller end clients or, or to make sure that all their clients fit into their profile going forward. Uh, the fund houses are looking at the advice market. They, they're looking, I think the private equity money has, with these firms is sort of overtaking them. Uh, there was a, I looked with one or two firms a uh, year or two ago, um, and they were looking at getting in. I think what's happened is realised at the moment, at the moment, the end is very crowded, as I said already. Um, there's a lot more interest at the top end. Interestingly enough, currently, smaller deals are now rarer. Um, and I say they're rarer, there's, there's deals out there, but there's, um, um, give an example, I had a company the other day, a chap was retiring, he wants to retire, wants to be out by the end of the year. Um, he's got about 15 million of funds under management, that's one, one farm. Nice business. Uh, a few years ago, two, three years ago, I would have had probably a queue of buyers wanting to buy that business. Now, um, it, it's more of a struggle. Uh, whether that be geography or just people are saying the cost of transition, actually, not just the buying the business, but also getting the clients across to um, their the, the company's um, setup, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute more. Go slide five, Charlie. Can I ask you a question before we go to slide five? Yeah, sure. So if this, if it's the cost of transition, which is a barrier. <clears throat> and and the barriers seem to be, or, or the difficulties seem to be in smaller companies. Uh, is that uh, an indication that really what they want is the whole company, the share capital, the trading asset, <clears throat> everything to stay in place? We'll just buy the shares, please. Thank you very much. We don't want we don't want retirement sales uh, and, and closing the firm yeah. you know, to, to get rid of past liabilities, sort of thing. We don't want to just buy the goodwill. Is that where we're going with this? Because in a very large firm, you wouldn't just buy the goodwill; you'd buy the buy the shares and the trade. absolutely, yeah. The, the, the larger firms, uh, all those deals are share purchase. They're, they're all, you know, they buy the they buy the direct the direct authorization. They buy it as a go. Um, they have to be in, in in a lot of cases. In fact, ninety nine percent of the cases because they they haven't got the infrastructure. Who they haven't got the advisors in place, so they need the existing principal of the business. Uh, they want him to work with. This is on the private equity. You need the principal of the business to be around for probably five years um, to to make sure the business continues because they haven't got 
they've got the money, but they haven't got any um, advisors at this moment in time. But if they bought a business in, uh, let's say, Norwich, um, they wouldn't be able to deal with the clients. So they need the people to stay around. Also, on these bigger deals, uh, the exit time, whereas on a smaller deal, you normally do it over a two year. So it's average, normal thing is up front, five, twenty five. With, with the bigger ones, uh, they tend to do it over, say, four or five years, because that's to make sure that the companies and everything just stays around. So uh, that's from that side. Um, it, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. We'll, we'll talk about um, valuing your business. Um, yeah, I mean, the key things, obviously, you've got your funds under management. Going back to the, the smaller bit businesses, one of the problems uh, I get, and it's uh, even now, today, even today, which I find sometimes quite uh, interesting, um, is that there's a lot of advisors out there who... I've spoke to a chap literally last week and he, I said, what's your back office system? And he said, I haven't got one. Um, he said, it's uh, filing cabinets. And I just, I mean, in this day and age, um, if, you, if you were a prospective buyer, you'd walk into his office, and look at filing cabinets or however many he had, um, and you, you've got to basically go through that work out what his business is, what you're going to pay for his business. Uh, or do you go down the road with somebody who's actually got a back office system with all the clients on it? Um, and uh, they can see exactly what they've got. Um, but it is, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. We've I've got one at the moment, quite a substantial business. And the buyer uh, wants to know the client holdings. And their guy is saying, well, it's, uh, I can't give you that in go through, etc. Um, it's quite a reasonable side company as well. And I would have thought uh, you need to have those sort of things to help value you. Make it, make it as transparent as possible. So if you say, if you've got 25 million of funds in the management with your clients, then if somebody comes along, you need to actually be able to show that to a prospective buyer. Um, so funds under management, what the yield is, uh, everybody thinks consolidators or acquirers are going to put it up to 1%. A lot of uh, companies I deal with are on 0.75. So they go along to a, a smaller IFA looking to purchase them. They're on 1%. And the purchasing company is on 0.75. So overnight, to a certain extent, it's going to get... Um, so it's not always uh, an uplift. The regulator are very uh, tough on that. Uh, obviously, the end game in some of these cases are on to their central proposition. Um, but there are a lot of companies out there who just want to build funds under management and, and what when they buy a business, they want to leave everything as it is. They don't want to rock the boat. Um, client holding is, uh, well, client holdings, average um, money, with per client, uh, husband and uh, wife are classed as one client. Uh, so the average now for most of these firms is between 250 and 300. If you've got a client base, when I talk to somebody and they say, oh, I've got 500 clients or something like that, um, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing because they don't want 500 people with 25 grand each. So, um, they're looking for a higher net worth. Age of clients, uh, again, is starting, is coming to the fore. Um, you don't really want to buy a client based with high proportion of what the regulator would deal with high vulnerable clients. Um, Cut off age uh, is probably 75. Um, anybody buying a business, they do realize that they will have. Um, clients of a certain age. So if it's two or three percent of the business, uh, they, they'll accept that. It's not an issue. It's when you've got a high proportion of clients of a certain age, uh, and the buyer will look at paying a uh, reduced fee for those clients.
Uh, any complaints? Well, that's straightforward enough. Uh, make sure everything's up to date. Um, the area, obviously, at the moment, this hot topic is the um, deal, uh, pension transfers, uh, anything. Pension transfers are, 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 I wouldn't say a no no because people realize the bigger the firm, the more chances would have done DB uh, work. Uh, however, if, if you've got obviously a British, no matter how low, it's, it's an issue. Um, last point on this one is um, where the funds are held. Uh, if you look at it, it's, it's again, if it's transactable and people, then it's, it's straightforward. Um, I think sometimes where I had one where they've got, uh, the chap had put nearly all his um, clients' funds with one DFM. Um, they said to him, you know, we'll service the clients and deal with the clients as well. It will reduce your BI cover. Um, and at the time when he did it, it looked a really good idea. The issue now is, is that there's a the relationship with the DFM and the clients. The advisor still gets um, his, his payment, but if he's trying to sell that business, um, he's struggling because any buyer is going to say, well, really, the DFM uh, have got the relationship. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's one just I'm just looking at maybe where the funds are going. Uh, go to six, Holly. Next. Okay. So, um, geography, uh, southeast, uh, northwest, southwest, but mainly, you know, of, of good areas. Um, the further you go out, um, the less buyers. It doesn't always happen that way, but sometimes you get a um, he wants a outlet in, say, Norwich as an example, or somewhere like that. geography is a key factor. Sorry, the, can I interrupt? The further yeah. out, from, the further out you go. Yes, you mean the further out from London. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of these companies are London based. <laughs> They've got to service it, or if they're based in the northwest. Um, I've got a company I we deal with very big in the northwest. They've got, they've got places across the country, but when it gets to the southwest, um, they've got nothing. Uh, they you know, wheelchairs back as far as that they can go. Um, what about anything, hasn't te- hasn't um, COVID changed all that with Teams calls and video calls and so on? Hasn't that all gone out the window? Um, I, some companies have, have adapted to it, but they're not they're not confident. Uh, if they're buying a new client based on them, that then switching the clients across to um, Teams uh, or Zoom, that the clients will go for it. Want people on the ground to service clients. Not in all cases, but they it's 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 the risk of retaining clients. If they're putting 15% on day one value of the business on the table and they, they want to put their um, and also the advisor selling wants to make sure that the clients stay because if it's on a two-year earn out, they, he wants to make sure that the clients are going to be happy. Um, the way the way most companies do it now is that they will pay the uh, retiring advisor, uh, in most cases, a retained fee for two years. So he's on the end of the phone um, just if there is an issue or question the client has, they've got the you've got the different advisor around to make sure the clients are happy with things going forward. Um, due diligence, file checks, audit, obviously IFAT. Um, again, some companies have got. Uh, I mean, all companies would do due diligence. Some companies do it differently. Nobody, there isn't any. I wish it was an industry standard due diligence to say. You know these twenty points who adhere to these, then uh, that's it, 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 industry badge standard of due diligence. Or if not, and um, each central acquirer will will want a style of due diligence. Um, so people say, "We said, well, what do I need?" And I said, "Well, to make it as clear as possible." Um, so uh, yeah, make it clear, clean as possible. 
support and, and transparent and uh, make sure the things like your um, PI uh, report for your PI, that sort of is all up to date. Um, and, and any any report up to date, complaints, procedures, etc. Um, valuation is on the smaller end of the scale. Uh, the value of the business is based on recurring income. Uh, so the average in the marketplace at this moment is well, it starts with a three. Um, and I think probably most businesses are between in 3.5, some are probably more. Um, if anybody offers you substantially more than that, uh, then there's probably going to be a lot of caveats around that. Um, and the risk is yours, not the buyers. I always think with these deals, um, if, if it's a good risk, both the seller and the buyer are going to make sure it works. If if I come along to you and say, right, I'll give you, you know, four times or five times your recurring income, uh, but I'm not going to put any money on the table on day one. I want you to transfer your clients into my uh, central investment property. And then after six months, I'll pay you the ones you've got to drop. Well, then to me, the risk is all with the seller, not with the, uh, not, not with the buyer. Because he will only pay what he gets. He uh, whereas if the buyer puts fifty percent on the table on day one, he's got to make sure it works. So smaller end, that's the multiple paid over two years: fifty percent upfront, twenty-five percent after month, a month twelve, twenty-five percent after four months. <coughs> on the bigger deals, I would say. Uh, Normally around 100 million plus. I know some firms will look at uh, funds down to sort of 50, 50 million. They do them on an EBITDA basis. Um, the multiplier is bigger, so it tends it to do six or seven times. However, that's based on the profit, not the recurring income. Um, in a lot of cases, that figure actually equates to the three to four times recurring income. So it don't sound bigger, somebody that they're going, we'll give you seven times. Um, it's seven times of profit, not recurring. Okay, so I've put on there, anything above the norm, tend to have caveats. Um, it's worth checking, getting a second opinion. Um, it, it, you know, not always, sometimes, because somebody comes along, it's worth just, you know, I was saying, checking what the marketplace will pay for your business. It only takes a phone call. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll go on to the next one. Seven. Okay. So, this, this is all about things. I will say, well, make sure your clients know the situation. Well, obviously, you're going to tell them that you're going to be retiring. Um, most guys I know, they, they pitch it as a, as opposed to actually selling their business, they pitch it as a, a merger um, transaction. So, they're merging in with a bigger company. Um, also, um, positioning it. So, a lot of um, advisors, printers, and uh, this. That's what you're busy with the client is um, to say, you know, I'm retiring uh, over the next year. I'm going to be around to help you merge in with a new company. Uh, and they're going to be an offer the same existing service plus X, Y, and Z on what I, what I can offer. So, it's, if you can do it as an upsell, the clients will be happy. Um, the actual figures on retaining clients after these deals uh, is, is something like 98.7%. So it's almost 99%. One of the concerns, people say, well, what about my clients? Are they going to, I'm not too sure, will, it, will they be happy? Um, most clients, but nearly all clients are happy if their advisor says this is a good firm, happy with that. Um, you know, where are they going to go? If they turn around and go, well, I don't want to go with this new firm, they're going to have to go out into the marketplace and look for a new advisor. Um, rather than, um, so it, what I'm saying, it's it's an almost a 99% um, standing of clients. Um, obviously, no outstanding issues. We've already touched on that. Um, but 
things like staff, uh, if the if the incoming firm is taking on staff, uh, they might have uh, they might be linked to things you've got to be uh, it would issues or not issues, making sure that's all done. Uh, office leases, again, um, most companies happening more now. So companies will take on the offices, uh, but that's only something that's happened in the last probably the years, and that's down to the private equity firm not needing a regional office. They'll take on the office. Um, in a lot of cases, if it's a smaller IFA, then the firm, incoming firm won't really want to have an office in. Um, due diligence is transparent. I've already touched on that. Um, contracts and lawyers. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is an interesting one because um, lawyers, if you're going to do a sale or a purchase, make sure you either speak to someone like myself or you get a financial services lawyer who's been done transactions. Um, the amount of times we get a situation where we get into a ping pong with the seller's lawyer and the buyer's lawyer because the seller has decided to use a chap known for years um, and, and it's the first sort of transaction he's done in financial services. And um, we do get situations where you know, we, I've had deals go on for several months. Lawyers have been going back and forth. Um, the only people that are gaming in that are the lawyers. They're charging it by uh, on an hourly basis. Um, and, and the clients, uh, both the buyer and the seller, get frustrated. So, um, yeah, there is also lawyers out there as well. Um, I know one, one or two that have done in financial services. And they will work on a fixed fee. Uh, I always try and get a fixed fee. Okay. Yeah. And finally, uh, that one there. Yeah. Go to that. Yeah. Uh, I've already said, yeah, 98% clients stay with the new firm. Um, make sure the culture is right of the new firm. And what I mean that is make sure that um, you get on with them. Because uh, if you get on with them, the chances are the client get on with them um, and if there are when we when we do these deals i will say to um, the seller uh if you've got any awkward questions i'll ask them because what you don't want to do is obviously uh you want a good work, working relationship going forward with the incoming party and if, if you have got one or two awkward questions just I'll say, well I'll, I'll ask them on um and, and the uh animosity out if there is any um let the new firm work with you and give them your full support. That's you're going to get paid money up front. You're going to get paid at the end of year one and, and the year two. So uh, it's it's a working together. It's a key factor for your clients uh, and yourself going forward. Charlie, next one. And I think the final um, point is enjoy retirement. That's the main <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah. Although I have got people recently in the last, um, of, of our, I mean, the youngest uh, sale I did, um, the advisor was um, 36. So it's not always people think that you've got to be of an age. Um, he had been in financial services since he was mid 20s, he's done over 10 years. Uh, he was 36 and he felt that being in financial services, he would. Um, have to stick it for the rest of his working career, and he fancied going off and uh, I think something like making all bad dreams or something like that. Completely opposite, but uh, yeah, that was that one. So uh, thanks for listening, and I'll put you across. I think Charlie's now coming in with his. Uh, yeah, can I ask a couple of questions, Peter? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so um, can I just play back to you what um, the takeaways that I've got, which is uh, slightly um, surprising. Um, it's certainly uh, going back a few years, it, all the um, uh, talk in the town was uh, for fund managers uh, to get and insurance companies, if it's uh, general insurance and, and so on, to get a route to market. So the wholesalers to get a route to market yeah, and yeah. Uh, particularly fund managers, you know, if you can get a, a small IFA producing um, with, you, you know, 10 IFAs doing 
three million a year, you're going to get uh, a new business. Um, you're going to get uh, 30 million a year coming into your new OIC fund, which if I'm hearing rightly, those days are, are sort of slipping away. And it's more about uh, it's more about the big U.S. companies coming across the Atlantic, Bruin Dolphin and Charles Stanley, Raymond James, those, those sort of uh, names getting bought and, and uh, buying and uh, more about and private equity packaging up those deals for, for those uh large banks and and foreign companies and it, and i i is, is that how you see it yeah absolutely i mean at the moment a lot of, there's a lot of american money that's come in um with, with private private firm my my feeling with it at the moment is um there's the figure is there's probably around 25 private equity back firms out there my take on it is that there's there's too many for protect you know the potential sellers out there. Um, because they all they all want the same company in they it's got to be over a hundred million um, it's got to be a sort of a regional based firm it's got to have this etc the, the advisors all the advisors got to be employed um, they've got certain criteria. Uh, that the issue is, is that you get firms that fit that profile. You've probably got ten, maybe ten companies facing them. Um, okay. And the, the other point, which is, um, you know, over the since RDR, there's been a, which and you appear to be sort of signif- signalling a change since RDR. There's a sort of move to restricted. Oh, just go restricted because that's what the buyers want. Almost that's what the buyers want. They want to see all the money going into the same fund, you know, and then they've got control and so on and so forth. But if I'm hearing this rightly, those days are slipping away, and now the the sort of sweet spot of 100 million funds under management. Uh, which lends itself to a share purchase, which lends itself to buying an existing business. It's very hard to get a license these days with the FCA. It's all very hard, you know, and uh, sort of freewheeling, sort of slightly cheap entrepreneurialism, slightly disappearing off the horizon. So if I'm reading this right, you're a small IFA family business, you know, maybe bringing in 10 or 20 million uh, a a year, new funds. But you should be really looking to have plus 100 million of funds under management. If you have to buy another firm to do that, then that's great. And present it as a firm, instead of focusing on where the funds are going, on the actual mechanics of the firm. You know, is it properly mm-hmm. run? You know, are you investing in, in the systems and controls of the actual business so that somebody can just literally just step in and, and carry on running it in the same way as it's always been run it, and just strip out the dividends? Yeah. More? yeah, absolutely. They, they the, the firm's... The back office um, is, is crucial to uh, getting a deal done. And, and potential buyers will pay more the cleaner the, the business. So the, clean, you know, the tidier the business, the, the more money you're going to get for it. I know it's probably obvious, but I mean, they, 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 they want to be able to uh, plug in their back office system to your back office system so they can yeah. look at everything. And for due diligence and that sort yeah of. well i know it sounds it might sound obvious but going back three or four years ago i can think of a uh well at least one uh deal which went through for a, a very large amount of money and but it's a retirement it's a um you know just transfer the goodwill and liquidate the company and actually you know mm. who gives a damn about the systems and controls and um you know and and somebody is slightly lucky really but uh, walks off with an awful lot of money and, and he never really invested in the business all he's done is make sure that all the funds end up with standard life or, or i think yeah, it was standard yeah. life in that case which is yeah, so that's yeah. a good change if, if i'm um, I mean, no yeah. i mean the thing, the thing is with the new the, the private equity back companies they will buy the business they will buy the shares they don't want to close down yeah well they want to do the due diligence then they want to do the due diligence and they want to that's why their due diligence is so intense um and, and can, I, uh, can i throw the Throw that onto the floor. Is anybody else wants to uh, ask any questions of Peter, particularly valuations? I did see one person reach for their calculator as you were talking. The um, and uh, before I go on to more technical stuff. Uh, yeah. So okay. you, sorry, go on. So yeah, it's all right, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you go first. Okay. Yeah, it's just a question pertaining to a view on exactly. I think what Charlie was talking about there one of the criteria of any potential future sale for us 
would immediately be that they didn't interfere with the investment management process that we've spent 20 years developing and honing. And an example of that would be, and forgive me, I don't know if you work for them, just down the road from me is AFH Financial. And the prospect of clients of mine staying around when a company just potentially buys a company and then flips something a bit like SJP into its own internal funds is just completely unpalatable. And I don't know if you have a view on that because we're not in the point of considering selling at the moment, but it is an overarching consideration because I could probably think of 50% of my clients who would just walk out the door straight away if we did that. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, I've never done any work with FH. So there are some, um, uh, you're probably going to say, you would say that anyway, but I mean, I've got to believe in in the buyer uh, to work with them and I've got to feel comfortable working with them. Because uh, I, what I don't want to do is, is a, a sell and open me up, you know, three months after the deal's been done and saying, like, you know, what have you got me into? So there are some uh, acquiring businesses, obviously, the usual suspect to me, uh, I, I work with them um, because they've just got a bad uh, reputation uh, from a client basis. I know if you talk to SJB clients, they love them, but it's... Um, now, I think most companies now realise that they're putting a lot of money into buying a business. They can't afford to, or as I say, move the furniture around. So the, the, the idea of just selling people for, on day one, um, A, the regulator doesn't like it, and also the, um, the actual uh, company, um, most companies now just, Want to leave. If it's a profitable business, why why move it? You know, why change? Salvo, I had a question. Yeah, happy to. Hi. Yeah, we communicated over the emails. So, yeah. how would you value my firm? So, eight hundred clients, five hundred k turnover, uh, all protections, uh, ten advisors, all employed. What is it worth? <laughs> yeah, it's. Okay, so what you've got, um, Salvo, you, obviously you, you've got a protection firm. Um, I was going to give you a, a call. I'm talking, I've got a meeting with somebody next week who, who, who are interested. Um, they are in the same marketplace as yourself. So the valuation on a... It, it's a it's a difficult one to a certain extent because um, it's not like funds where you can, you've got it ongoing. However, um, on a, I would say, a, a protection type business, you're probably looking at a multiple um, of somewhere around one to one and a half times, something like that. Terry, you the had a question. Net. Sorry? Yeah, yeah can, can we, 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 we can't do We don't want yeah, to do it. On, on, they look at turnover, look at the client base, um, and then put a valuation on it. It's. It, it's um, it's it's not an actual, you know, it's down to what somebody wants to pay for it. And, and if they want to, they're looking to expand. You might get a bigger price than, you know, someone else. If you pitched it to a lot of clients, I'm sorry, prospective buyers, they're only interested in uh, pensions and, and investments. Um, but yeah, as I said, if, okay. if you go to the marketplace, we can see. Uh, I'll talk Terry, to you next you week, someone. Yeah, Sorry, th thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple of observations. I mean, as you, as you know, when uh, when we uh, created Bespoke uh, in its current format uh, in 2017, we bought we, we bought the firm with its existing um, FCA registration in place, and that was the, the reason we did that was because they had their existing registration in place, uh, and the the fact that it was taking so long for the FCA to authorise new firms, um, that's why we did that. And we still have a relationship with the previous directors uh, that we bought out, again, back in 2017. In fact, I spoke to one of them last week. Now, they're out of the business. They've been paid off, etc. 
but we still have a good enough relationship that we can call them if we've got a question or a query about a particular client. The other one I was going to point out was that in 2020, we bought a firm uh, which was referred to us by Nucleus, the platform. Yeah. Uh, and when we did that, um, we've we've had issues with that, but they're all positive. There are some issues in terms of the fact that we've now agreed a final payment ahead of the um, ahead of the original date because we want them out of the way um, because the, uh, the the previous principal was still in touch with a number of the clients. Um, and we were concerned about him um, doing potential reputational damage, not literally, but he was advising them on business purchases. He was advising them on property purchases and stuff like that. What's your question, Terry? The question was, which, which is the best route to, to take? Is it to buy a firm with an existing uh, client bank um, and manage the funds going forward, or do we actually then liquidate the assets and put them onto our platform uh, because we're looking at new purchases at the moment? I, I would say personally, if depending on the size, um, if if you were buying a smaller business, then I would probably just say buy buy the assets. Right. If it's a if it's a bigger business, then buy the shares. Right. You know, take on the FDA. Uh, regulation and that's why it okay i'm going to rattle on through my slides because that's what i came here for <laughs> so um, i'm going to do six key points of selling at the start if you're selling a business anyway which is obviously if you're buying a business you just re re put a mirror to the same deal first of all you've got to have a reason to sell okay i we peter and i both speak to people who possibly a, a window shopping to see who's out there which is all very well but it risks winding the buyers up actually and um they want to know what you know they want a, a decent story if you're retiring you're retiring or if you want to do something else you're doing something else but they don't want to hear you you going all vague on it secondly is how much um uh ha how much and and it's really important to create a bidding war if you can or, or to get two people involved and um in order to drive up the price or at least have some card to play and um, there's obviously value on the, on the dividend yield or, and um, you need to have a have a look at the setup costs to start a new business now is, is very awkward, as I, I referred to. You've got to get the FCA on board after you've, I mean, bizarrely, it could take you six months to get a, a blank shell registered with the FCA. And only then can you go and get a bank account um, set up. And only then can you go and get an agency set up with, with providers who all then want meetings and guarantees and so on. So it's it's um, considerably more difficult than it was a year ago, and a, and and in multiple backwards going back twenty years when you you put an application in, somebody phoned you up and said said what they thought of it, and three months later you, you've got a um, you've you've got a, a license or not. Um, so and keep an eye on what others are paying, the same thing, and the value of the future cash flow for the for the other business. Um, how is it paid? Also, have a you need to have a think really before you pick up the phone, so to speak, as to where you whether you want shares or cash. And it's all very well. Everybody says, "Oh, just take the share, take the cash." But um, actually, the shares can work out extremely well. And uh, you need to have a think. You know, everybody wants oh cash up front, but it's you're getting a discount for cash up front. And if you take shares over a long term, you know you're going to get a significantly higher premium. Think about the timing. Um, think about uh, liability caps. Uh, think about uh, when you're going to get paid. And uh, remember that uh, if you're employing people in your business, you know, they are highly likely to be the key key buyers. So uh, just keep them in mind, whether it's and you can dress that up as a fancy shareholder, employee shareholder trust, you know, where the employees all become and, and then put some article together saying how, how good for the um everybody you are good for the um company and, and the staff empowerment that you've been but but um so there are different ways of doing it but it will give you an exit but they're the people who understand the business who know the business and um who could possibly take it on beyond um beyond you 
Um, uh, and <clears throat> goodwill or shares, which Peter's touched on actually, as to what you're selling. And um, as he sort of intimated, if 100 million minimum funds under management is the uh, sort of sweet spot. And of course, for the uh, big buyers, you know, the more, it's the same amount of due diligence to buy a small company, which could have a, a real nasty um, couple of surprises in them, which could take just as long to sort out as as in a big firm. So the due diligence costs them the same, whether it's big or small. So there are significant economies of scale um, there. And um, so, and the goodwill seems to be um, less popular now, according to uh, Peter's analysis of, of the market, of the, of the buyers. And of course, with shares, you get, uh, if you're selling the shares, you get entrepreneurs relief, which is obviously um, uh, helpful, 10% tax. And um, so quite a few people put their spouse in as, as um, shareholders, but of course, don't forget, they've got to actually work to get the, to get the tax relief. Um, and be shown to have worked but anyway that's one for your accountant points of due diligence uh again the, fo the following are essential before you pick up the phone that your your accounts are up to date okay it, it's um you know this it's questions that people are going to ask straight up front so if you pick up the phone and you say well i'll get <laughs> you in six months time well that's it's sort of like a it's um okay well you know phone me in six months and you wonder what the point of the phone call was to, to be honest and and you should you should really be able to do that and i don't think you can run a modern ifa practice without a system like zero or sage or, or quickbooks even but that's personal opinion if you're very organized perhaps you can um but you need to have be able to press a button and, and print out your balance sheet basically um, the same goes with the reg data returns it's not unreasonable for the fca to expect firms to do that and, and to expect firms to be able to quite easily submit their reg data returns every six months, again, by pressing a button on what their balance sheet is, so to speak, from a system. Um, you, there are, they will expect, um, everybody will expect a, a firm to have a compliance. Well, the, the first thing they'll ask is for, can I see your last compliance audit? And can I see, you know, a sample of your external file checks? So, and that's, that's pretty straightforward actually. And um, everybody's going to be asked that question at some stage. Not all IFA firms do it, but, uh, well, not all firms do it, but uh, it's, it gets reflected in a price later on. And uh, there are examples which we've seen of uh, firms failing the due diligence later on because they simply haven't had that. Or oh, our compliance is absolutely fantastic. We check them all internally. We're, we're, you know, I do it myself, says the chief executive, which is, just sort of fatal error. It sounds like you're doing the right thing, but but uh, just brings the risk in house, the risk of error in house, and uh, very often, and there's a conflict of interest is the, the revenue against the compliance minimum standards. So let's see your last compliance audit, and let's see some external file checks. Uh, breaches and complaints, hopefully they'll be very small, but um, you, you are supposed to keep a register. There is one on BAT, and uh, so keep an eye on that. And uh, having a nil breaches and nil complaints is not really the right answer, actually, <laughs> because it's, you're basically saying we never make mistakes. Um, the PI, so it's not about we never make mistakes. It's about uh, what you do when you do make a mistake. It's, it's, or, you know, every company run has issues and every people make mistakes the pi documentation is is very simple i think uh, peter's probably in line with me that uh, you can value a business extremely quickly really from uh, from what's on the on the on those five documents there show us your last pi return assuming that uh, people fill them in honestly that's um that's all disclosed there you'd be crazy not to to go uninsured the by filling it in incorrectly um so maybe a sanity check on the person but um so pi documentation the accounts are up to date have a look at the accounts have a look at the reg data returns and you're pretty close to being there have a look at the last compliance audit and you're pretty much um got a value of the business in your hand um uh and the new business register obviously that's um that uh goes without saying although we did come across a business which i tried to sell the other day and then i to my, my astonishment he, he didn't have a register I, I can hardly believe it but uh, it's a bit like a ship coming into port and telling the harbour master that he doesn't have a log um but he can tell him you know but don't worry i can <laughs> i can tell you if you'd like to sit down i'll tell you where the ship's been you know you've got to have a log uh 
contracts, etc. That's uh, sort of fairly straightforward, really, and uh, tax situation. And uh, and uh, you need to ha have advisors in place, obviously, and you need to think about that. You know who's who's doing what. And um, in my experience, um, they are quite helpful actually it might walk off with quite sizable fees mergers and acquisitions agents and, and so on but they're around in every industry they used to advertise in the sunday times and that sort of thing franchise type um business sales obviously peter does it and we do a limited amount the but um, they they can be very helpful um firms like that i'll just get rid of that call on my mobile i'll phone you back i'm afraid so um Next slide is uh, tips from experience. Um, uh, dilution clause, if taking um, shares, just be aware if they do offer you shares that uh, in uh, my own experience, I, I sold a business for a um, significant amount of money really with extremely fancy um, lawyers who charged um, 25,000 if I remember rightly. And nobody at any stage mentioned to me, well, perhaps it should have been obvious to me, but anyway, about a dilution clause. And uh, so needless to say, I bought them and then, uh, you know, took the shares and, and six months later I was diluted down by half. You know, thank you very much. They just, they just took half my money off me. I, I can hardly believe that no, no, none of these fancy lawyers who all, all portray themselves as experts in the industry, of course. And uh, in that case, I was clever enough to say, oh, could you pay my uh, advisor's fees? So I wasn't even a, a question, you know. So, oh, yes, we don't mind paying that. It's a nice, easy one to slide across table by the way that it's um it's uh just just pay my fees while you're at it but um <laughs> heavens do we need to call a doctor <laughs> so um tips from experience um if you take life commission on trail uh more people are doing that um that's uh it's a very worthy thing to do and uh it allows you in the last year or two um to uh switch back to indemnity and um it basically trebles the turnover from that source um the, the indemnity commission debt is is hidden on the balance sheet which is an amazing thing really and um you know most i think you're supposed to reserve two and a half percent um to three percent on on the balance sheet for it but um unless you've worked in the industry you you've really it's really hard to get to understand that you've just borrowed the money off of a life office and, and it's a it's a debt on the balance sheet and it simply doesn't show on the balance sheet as a, as a creditor that's and very it, sneaky charlie <laughs> Well, and watch for it if you're a buyer, you know, watch out for it. I've, I've never actually come across anyone doing it, but I mean, it just seems like common sense to me. And, you know, you, you're, um, it, it just seems like um, an obvious thing to do if, you, if you're selling your business. It's not, it's not, it's not I mean, you say it's sneaky, but I mean, it's there. It's, it's um, you, if any, if you know what you're doing, you know, there's two and a half percent reserved on the balance sheet for that, um, yeah. for that cost of clawback. Um, if the deal is, I think Peter said this before, if the deal is wrong, the deal is wrong. Okay, cultural fit, trusted gut, no amount of paperwork will put it right. And um, I can't emphasize that enough, actually, I've, I've, having done them wrongly in my, <laughs> with the right legal paperwork in the past. <laughs> it's, um, that was a waste of time. So um, uh, tips from experience. Um, the... Uh, If the deal is wrong, the deal is wrong. Okay, so the next one is hidden assets. Um, there's always hidden assets in a business purchase, in my experience. They're, they're always there, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, for instance, renewal commission, obviously it's a lot of firms, particularly in the old day, it probably happens less now, but put their bon directors put their bonuses annually into a pension scheme, you know, 10, 20, 50,000 pounds contributions in the, in the old days. Um, and it's, it's rarely recognised properly by the IFAs. Um, as basically as renewal commission, because in, in the RFA's eyes, maybe it's not um, in the bag, but uh, every year, but uh, you're if you line up the directors, you know, they say, oh yes, of course, I always make a one-off contribution, that type of thing. Heads of terms, um, uh, it's important to get to a heads of terms and um, very quickly, actually, if you want to be a buyer or a seller. And um, so it's helpful to link it to some, some intangible like, uh, level of annual rather than a fixed number so level of annual income over the last six months type thing um but do watch out or, or use it to your advantage um heads of terms can be legally um 
enforceable if you withdraw from them. So um, hold on one second. SP share purchase agreements, warranties, indemnities, earnouts, and tax. That's um, those are the key key items. Uh, do your due diligence if you're buying or, or if you're selling. That's it. Once they've been through all that and they get to a share purchase agreement, um, and you've and you've sold it, that's that's it. So uh, unless you found it out before you sign, it's your um, that that's the end of that. Right. With that, um, I've come to a, it's ten fifty five. So there's a few minutes left for questions. If, if you've got any questions based on uh, to follow. Yeah, I've got a question or two actually. Um... In terms of the uh, business with a value below 100 million under management, what is the the prospect of sales in that respect? Where would where would buyers come from in that respect? Um, and then the second question is, if you are managing funds for clients, um, pensions, and that, is it more attractive to a buyer to have? Uh, bespoke portfolios for your clients or more of a standard sort of um, model portfolio type thing provided by a platform or somebody like that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the uh, just to add with the, the uh, portfolio, uh, standard, the more that it's in a standard say, um, platform, uh, the more interest you will get. If, if it's too um, uh, I would say if it's too sort of uh, intricate, uh, then the buyer would look at it and think, well, you know, we don't use that platform, we don't use that um, that investment procedure, uh, so that doesn't fit what we uh, what we do. Uh, as opposed to if it's on a sort of platform, um, usual sort of big name platform, then buyers will look at that and say, okay, we can see that. That's fine. Um, the buyers going on for some hundred billion uh, businesses. There are national buyers out there for, for that marketplace that they want to hold on. Um, so they, they get somebody, you know, they've, they've got an office in, uh, let's say, Bristol. Um, they've got a regional office in Bristol and they want to bolt on more funds to that. So they would look at, say, you know, businesses a lot less than hundred billion to bolt on their regional offices. So they're out there. Uh, there is also a lot of the ones I, the sort of buyers I like, not that they're any different to the nationals, but I do, I do like dealing with the sort of what we call the larger regional firms because they are, they sort of cover the southwest or they cover the southeast or they cover the sort of Dorset, Wiltshire region or whatever. Um, they, they're a lot easier to deal with for the, um, for the smaller buyers because they, they can, they can personalise uh, the deal, whereas the larger um, nationals have got a template. And if you don't fit that template, then you know, you've got to fit it with them as opposed to um, they, they sort of move you know, in with you, if that makes sense. So the regional firms I like dealing with because they can structure a deal that fits in with, the, uh, with yourself and your clients, um, and, and they, they've got more flexibility. Because you're dealing with the main man as opposed to dealing with um, uh, an acquisitions sector of a, of a national. Cool, thank you. Okay. Two minutes to go. <laughs> if there's any more questions, fire them out now. Otherwise, we, we might draw this to a close. Super. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Um, and for everybody for attending. And... Um, uh, and um, have a good day, have a good weekend, and uh, we'll see you next week. Charlie, could you stay on the line for a moment? By all means. Thank you very much. Thank you.